Smartest Person Alive, 2014, Part 2 of 5. 1.8 million people have been chemically synthesized by the powers of the universe since we last viewed this screen. Coming in at number 20 in this year's countdown is Danish child prodigy Lars Humbledink. After teaching himself to read at age 1, at age 2 he was found making notes to himself using upside down mirror writing, similar to how Da Vinci used to conceal his ideas. At age 4 he had mastered calculus, graduated high school at age 6, college at age 9, and at age 12 he famously solved a double slit experiment and is currently in the MD-PhD program at Oxford in the field of neuroengineering. Alright, that's a joke, but I put it in there because you're not going to see me doing any of these this kid is smarter than Einstein news media fakes using the so-called ratio IQ trick. One kid, he's four, and he has the mental ability of an eight-year-old. He's also got the same IQ as Bill Gates, Stephen Hawking, and Einstein. People who post stuff like this last guy make me sick. Nobody has respect for intelligence anymore. Not only are you selling out the kid by putting him on a pedestal he's never going to get to, but you're selling the rest of us fools go by claiming that just because a four-year-old kid can read at the eight-year-old level that he's the next Einstein. Coming in at number 20, for real this time, is American computer mogul Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft, whose software is responsible for the screen you see in front of you right now. He has a Dawkins number of four plus or minus, which means he's agnostic about God. At age nine, he'd read the entire world book encyclopedia. As a teenager, like Linus Pauling, he started his first company. At age 17, he boasted to everyone that he would be a millionaire by age 30. At age 19, he dropped out of Harvard. At age 20, founded Microsoft and by age 44 had a net worth of $100 billion. One of my biggest memories of Harvard came in January 1975 when I made a call from Courier House to a company in Albuquerque, New Mexico that had begun making the world's first personal computer. I offered to sell them software. I worried they would realize I was just a student in a dorm and hang up on me. Instead, they said, we're not quite ready come see us in a month, which was a good thing because we hadn't written the software yet. <laughs> From that moment, I worked day and night on the extra credit project that marked the end of my college education and the beginning of a remarkable journey with Microsoft. At number 19 is Jürgen Mimkes, a German metallurgist, solid state thermodynamicist, and one of the world's only current dual professors of econophysics and sociophysics. He's the current number one ranked existed social Newton, and he's one of the only few people to make a connection between the work of Empedocles, Goethe, and Willard Gibbs. A social Newton is someone who's been able to come close to formulating the mechanics of social systems the same way Newton formulated the mechanics of the solar system. Shown here are the top social Newtons of history in ranked order. Vilfredo Prado, the Newton of the moral world. Henry Carey, the Newton of sociology. Lester Ward, the American Aristotle. Charles Fourier, the Newton of the moral sciences, or a social Newton. Here's Memkes in December of last year with co-authors, physicist Peter Richman and physicist Stefan Hutzler at the book launch party of their new Econophysics and Physical Economics, wherein they apply the laws of thermodynamics as developed by Willard Gibbs to economics. Now here is the social Newton rankings for existive social Newtons. And we see that Mimkes is ranked in at number one. So to try to explain what Mimkes work is all about, I'm gonna use the example of Bill Gates in the previous clip. Gates says that in January of 1975, he made a call after which he went on a remarkable journey. And 32 years later, he's giving the commemoration speech at Harvard, the school that he dropped out of. But to explain, everyone knows that when a rock falls off a cliff, you can say that it goes on a remarkable journey and falls through a gravitational potential and reaches the ground at a certain time later. And it falls through what's called the gravitational potential. And the person who formulated those equations of motions are Newton. Now the same equations of motion apply just when Gates falls through what's called the gravitational electromagnetic potential through his remarkable journey and goes through his reaction path and winds up 32 years later as a one of the biggest computer moguls in the world. The difference between the gravitational potential and the 
gravitational electromagnetic potential that Gates fell through is that the equations of motion are come from Willard Gibbs and they're called what's called the Gibbsian to explain or to give a little history in the 17th century Newton formulated the laws of motion then in the next century Lagrange formulated what's called a force function which in the which is an equation that maps the movement of particles in the system by way of summation of their potential energy added with their kinetic energy to give one equation that gauges the tendency for the system to decrease to its lowest potential. That in turn got rewritten by William Hamilton in terms of the what's called the Hamiltonian. That in turn got re-modified by first Rudolf Clausius in, into the form of the first and second law of thermodynamics and then by American engineer Willard Gibbs in terms of the chemical potential of an isothermic isobaric system which is what social systems are. Now the first person to do that historically to take the work of Willard Gibbs and apply it to social systems and economic systems was Lawrence Henderson at Harvard who added the work of Vilfredo Pareto who's behind us right here together with Gibbs and taught an entire curriculum of this at Harvard in the 1930s. So what Memkes is doing is taking the Lagrangian, formulated, formulating that into the Gibbsian and explaining the potentials of economic systems and social systems, just as Newton formulated the mechanics of the solar system or say rocks falling to its gravitational potential. Now what this gets into is the sense of senses of purpose. In the old days Aristotle would say that the rock fell through a height because it was tele teleologically going towards towards its final cause. That is its optimal location in the universe. Aristotle teleology however is an outdated theory and it's defunct now. We now no longer understand a rock falling as being its go as being its teleological purpose. In the same way that we do not say that Gates' teleological purpose was to form Microsoft, but we do say that Gates, in that when he made that phone call, divined a sense of purpose, as Einstein would say, and then he fell through his gravitational potential and reacted with society forming Microsoft. So that's the gist of what Memphis is doing in his work and why he's the number one social Newton is that he's taking Lagrangian, mixing that together, formulating the Gibbsian, and applying that to sociology and economics, and nobody in America right now is doing that. I tried to uh, get Memphis to send me a video clip of him explaining his theory, but presently he's lecturing in Cairo. Anyway, here's a clip of Memphis and his two co-authors at the book launching party in Trinity College, Dublin, on December 10th, 2013, and here's uh, Hutzler making an attempt at singing the song, Money, That's What I Want. Let's hope that Hutzler sticks to his day job. Coming in at number 18 is American mathematician Stephen Wolfram, a 2011 Greatest Living Genius nominee, a 2011 Smartest Man on the Earth, Highest IQ nominee. At age 12, he wrote a dictionary on physics. At age 14, he wrote three books on particle physics. He got his PhD in particle physics at Caltech at age 20. Soon thereafter, he designed Mathematica, the leading software program for engineers. And he's currently working on the Wolfram Alpha Answer Engine. I've been interested for a long time in questions about sort of what's, what is the essence of mathematics. Um, I make my living building this thing called Mathematica, <laughs> which uh, attempts to cover the, in the broadest possible sense the kinds of things that mathematics might encompass. Mm -hmm. um, but so a question that I've been interested in also from the point of view of basic science is, is the mathematics that we sort of practice today the only possible mathematics? Or is it a mathematics that is sort of a great artifact of our civilization, Correct. but sort of a historical accident mm -hmm. artifact? The conclusion that I've sort of resoundingly come to is that the mathematics that we have today is in fact really a historical artifact. Coming in at number 17 is American physical chemist Thomas Wallace. He's the current number two ranked existive social Newton. His 2009 
the fundamentals of thermodynamics applied to socioeconomics is a ripe and on-target reality called reposte that is comparable to Frederick Rossini's famous 1971 chemical thermodynamics in the real world, both of which explain the rise and falls of civilizations according to chemical thermodynamics. Wallace is a physical chemist by training, where at the Illinois State University taught courses in chemical thermodynamics, kinetics, and polymer science. Then in 1988, he became president of Illinois State University, where he formed the Center for Mathematics, Science, and Technology, and in 2009, published his magnum opus, Wealth, Energy, and Human Values, wherein he defines people and societies chemically, according to which the thermodynamic parameter free energy represents the fundamental driving force in nature and determines whether physical and chemical processes conducted by nature and society will take place. He defines the rise and falls of civilizations according to the following equilibrium adjusting reaction equation, where P is the primitive phase, F the feudal phase, S the state phase, I the imperial phase, the double arrow means dynamic equilibrium, and the one-way arrow means complete conversion to products. According to Wallace, societies can be mapped chemically on reaction coordinates, and transitions from one type of society to another can be mapped according to initial state energies and final state free energies. All of this is decades, if not a century, ahead of anything that's being taught right now in the world. Coming in at number 16 is American mathematician Terence Tao. He's a superscholar.org top 10 smartest person alive 2012, smartest man in the world nominee 2013, smartest living person at ranker.com 2009. He's known for his work in mathematics, in particular the Green Tau theorem. He's a famous child prodigy, ranked in with an IQ of 230 when he was young. He won the Fields Medal at age 31, and a read through of his UCLA faculty favorite quotes page shows he's a sharp thinker. What I want to talk about. Um, in this address is the impact of the internet uh, and all the unreasonably effective services the internet has spawned from modern search engines to Wikipedia and the list goes on. So we all know the internet has revolutionized area after area in our life, you know, entertainment, journalism, even politics won't be the same ever again. But to people like us, to academics, um, you know, we like to feel more protected from this internet revolution. We are in our ivory towers, we have our tenure, our expertise, our academic traditions. You know, we, are, we don't believe that our classes can be replaced by a Wikipedia entry or our research by a search engine, at least not yet. Um, so it's true, we are not yet you know, redundant, but I do feel that major change is coming because of the internet, even to academia. And I wanted to give some examples of this in my own field, mathematics. So consider teaching. Um, there's a mathematical topic. It's called Mobius transformations. It doesn't matter what it is for this talk. Um, Mobius transformations. And it's taught in 1,000 math departments across the world every year to about 30, 50 students at a time. I've done it several times myself. But if you go to the web and search for Mobius transformations in a search engine, very quickly, you'll find this wonderful YouTube video that explains these transformations in a lovely, beautiful video, classical music, it's beautiful. Um, and it actually explains it a lot better than, than many math professors can, can, can explain it. It has been viewed 1,600,000 times 